So again, thank you so much for coming to our fourth in the Women Speaker Series. Um, at Haverford Trust, one of the things we thought would be an interesting initiative for 2011 was to host a series of discussions for women, by women. We uh, were attempting to educate, inspire, motivate through the different discussions that we've had, and today will be an education. Um, Stephanie, whose um, biography is on your table here, is really going to have a nice conversation with us for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, you do have a copy of all of her slides, and in the back there's a nice glossary of terms that will be commonly used that you can take home and study tonight. Don't worry, there's no exam. Um, but what Stephanie's going to do is give you some things to think about and some experiences that she has seen as to how trust may be a useful tool to meet some of life's challenges. So with that, Stephanie, why don't you come on up? I am so honored to be speaking to such an amazing group of people today and to be part of Haverford Trust Speakers Series. I've always believed that the time that I spent educating my friends and my clients was time spent developing a close, good working partnership. And that's what this program does. It empowers women with knowledge so that they can make educated decisions in their life and in their financial affairs. Today's topic is using trust to face life's challenges. Trust. Trusts are often maligned. We've all heard the comments. I don't know why Aunt Edith left her estate to me in trust. I don't need a trust. It must have been her lawyer's idea. And that trustee, they never give me any of my money. Now, when I came out of law school, I probably would have been sympathetic to this woman. You see, in law school and in so many financial advisors, they always emphasize the tax savings aspects of a trust. And if your goal is to save taxes, then I think the trust should be the least restrictive as possible in order to meet your tax goal. But I'm not here to talk about tr taxes. I'm here to talk about trust. As I matured as a lawyer, I began to see trust as a problem-solving tool. Sometimes the problems were obvious, other times more subtle, and sometimes unforeseen. Today I'm going to share with you some real-life stories from my clients. Their names have been changed, and at times I've put together more than one story just to make the point. But they're all rooted in real-life situations where a trust was used to address one of life's challenges. Oh yes, and that beneficiary I mentioned, you only hear half of the story. You see, her aunt also left her a million dollar IRA, and she managed to blow through it in less than two years. This trust is her only remaining source of income. Suffice it to say, if the aunt had not put this money in trust, it would be gone too. I think Aunt Edith did know what she was doing, and I think it's sad that the beneficiary doesn't see the irony in her complaints. But before I start talking about my clients, I thought we should have a primer on trust. What's a trust? Well, this is my definition. A trust is created when someone gives something to someone for the benefit of someone. Now, I know that's not a very technical definition, but every trust can be analyzed if you first look for these four, these four components. A trust is where the grantor, the grantor is the person who gives something to the trust, who contributes something. And what do they give? They give property. Property can take the form of cash, investments, real estate, business interests, and other things. Who do they give it to? They give it to the trustee. The trustee is the person or the entity that agrees to be responsible for that property. And they hold it, invest it, and distribute it for the benefit of the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries are everyone who could possibly receive a benefit from the property in that trust at any time during the term of that trust. One thing that makes trust 
complicated to understand, is that the same person can act in more than one role. The grantor can be the trustee. They can also be the beneficiary. Whether that's a good idea or not depends on what you're trying to accomplish and maybe family dynamics. A trust is a separate entity. It's separate from the grantor, it's separate from the trustee, and it's separate from the beneficiaries. Trusts are separate tax entities. Sometimes the, the taxes are paid by the grantor. Sometimes they're paid by the trust, and sometimes they're paid by the beneficiary. Again, it all depends what you're trying to accomplish. Another thing that makes trust more complicated than necessary is the terminology. These are the words that I prefer using. These are the technical words I use. But there are so many others for the same basic concepts. At the back of your handout, as Binny said, there's a glossary. I try to have a lot of the common synonyms for these words and other words that are used to describe trust. And I hope you'll refer to them later when you're trying to decipher or understand a writing about trust. So, why do I like trust? Well, let me tell you about Mary. Mary first came to my office when, uh, to have, uh, for help to have her husband's uh, estate settled. It was very straightforward. Mary was named as the executor. She was the sole beneficiary, and there were no trusts involved. Mary's challenge was what to do with the cash that was in the estate. You see, right before her husband got ill, he sold his business. And he was standing, and she had a large amount of cash. Mary was articulate and bright, but she had never been up or paid much attention to their finances. That was his job. Now she was faced with the challenge of what to do with his cash. She was sitting in cash, not by choice, but by default. A friend from church suggested that she go and meet with his financial advisor. When she did, he suggested that she give all of her cash to him and he would invest it for a fee and she would not have to do anything. He would take care of it all. Then he handed her a contract. Well, fortunately, Mary knew better than to sign that contract and she told him she had to have it reviewed by her lawyer. When she sat down with me, she said, I don't know what to do, she said, but I know one thing, I don't want to be taken care of. What do I want? I want to be educated. I want to know about investments. I want to learn. I want to be involved in my management of my funds. I want to remain self-sufficient. And I want unfettered access to my money. The problem was she didn't know how to get there. I recommended that she set up a funded, revocable trust. Sometimes they're called living trusts. She would be the grantor. She would be the trustee, and she would be the sole beneficiary during her lifetime. She would contribute the cash to the trust, and I suggest that she appoint a corporate trustee to serve with her. This way, she would have the benefit of professional investment advice from someone who owed her a duty of care. This was a good idea. She thought this was a good idea, but she was also concerned about what would happen when she was advanced in her aging and maybe not able to handle her own finances. I told her that if she had been working with a corporate trustee for a while, they would have a good idea of what her standard of living was, what her needs were, and what her investment philosophy was. And they could step in and serve alone seamlessly in the event that she couldn't handle things herself. After speaking for, to a number of banks and trust companies, she chose Haverford Trust as her co-trustee. Now it's two years later. Mary knows a lot about investments. She understands the standard of living that she can easily maintain based on her assets. She knows that when she no longer can handle things herself, that her trustee will step in seamlessly, and that it, she has added more money to this trust because she feels that she is truly in control of her financial future. Mary's concern was concerned with her lifetime challenges. Many times, my clients are more concerned about what happens to their estate after they die. That's the situation with Sonia. Sonia 
was a cougar. Yeah, her husband was about 14 years younger than she was and barely older than her children. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Things were going great <laughs> until she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that made her face her mortality. And then she realized that she needed a different balance between her children and her new husband. She had a prenuptial agreement, so she wasn't required by law to leave him anything. But she decided that she wanted to supplement his retirement income if she were to die. We talked about setting up a testamentary trust. A testamentary trust is one that takes effect after your life and is usually found in your will. It was also a family trust because not only was her husband the beneficiary, but her children and grandchildren could be beneficiaries immediately. When her husband turned 65, he would get a specific percentage of this trust. Now, I'm going to make a side point. This was not the only thing that she did as part of her estate plan. This was just one part of it. The trust could also provide for her children in emergency situations and for her grandchildren's education. And if her husband remarried, because this wasn't prohibited by tax law, um, if, she, if he remarried, he no longer got any distributions from the trust. And then the trust would continue for her children and for her grandchildren. Now, the trust addressed most of her challenges, except for one. Who would serve as trustee? Couldn't be her husband. Couldn't be her kids. That would never work with family dynamics. She ended up choosing her brother and gave him the ability to name a corporate trustee if he felt it was necessary, or to name a successor if he could no longer serve. Sonia's estate plan was subject to some taxes at her death. And sometimes that's a goal, something we want to avoid. But in Sonia's case, she weighed the two. And to her, it was more important that her goals be met than to defer the taxes until her husband died. Sonia's a cancer survivor, so we haven't seen these trusts work yet. But she's comfortable knowing that she has met her goals through careful estate planning, so when the day comes, it will have been addressed. Now, my client, Irene, my client, Irene, had a different challenge. She was also concerned about after-death distributions, but her needs were very different. She's a wonderful woman. She's a caregiver. She's very close to her children and wanted to treat them equally. And she told me all she wanted was a simple will. I explained to her that her estate, really very little was going to pass under the will because she had a life insurance policy, she had annuities, and a very large retirement plan. All of these assets would pass by beneficiary designation. After doing some calculations and exp uh, for taking into effect the taxes that would be due at her death, I told her how much each child would basically get. She started crying. But if I give her that money, much money, she'll die. Die? Nothing in our conversation up to that point ever led me to believe that, there was going, that this would be her response. As we talked some more, she explained to me that her daughter had a serious drug problem. She was clean right now, but she had relapsed a number of times. And the pressure and the responsibility of having that much money would be too much for her. And she feared that she would relapse. I told her that we could set up a trust for her daughter. She said, but it, it's an IRA. They only have a line they want to name people. I explained to her that trust can be a beneficiary of an IRA. It makes it a little more difficult. And sometimes there's a tax cost associated with that. But in this situation, what are taxes when it's your child's life at stake? She was very happy to hear that. When I said to her that we could let the trustee know about Kathy's drug addiction and pro her drug problem, she said that was not acceptable. 
because having it written down in the trust document would undermine everything she had been trying to do, to give Kathy the support that she needed in order to face each day. We needed a trust that would be generous when it was needed, would provide help if, her, if she relapsed. Somehow we had to make the trustee aware of Kathy's problems without undermining that support that her mother had always given her. I recommended that we set up a testamentary trust that would look just like any other trust, with no mention of her addiction. It would allow for distributions, discretionary distributions, nothing mandatory, for her health, education, maintenance, and support. Those are common words that lawyers use all the time. She would have a corporate trustee because she didn't want her children to be responsible and to deal with Kathy if they, or her other children, to deal with Kathy if she was using again. And I had Irene write a formal letter of instructions that would supplement the trust document, that would add additional information for the trustee should, I, should Kathy start using again. And that letter was given to her son with the instructions to give it to the corporate trustee only in the event he suspected that his sister was using. Since the testamentary trust does not take effect until Irene dies, she can change it, if need to, by circumstance, because of circumstances and developments. In the meantime, Irene know, is comfortable knowing that she's made provisions for her daughter to support her, even after her death. Now, Irene faced a problem with drug addiction. But this concept of supporting and providing for a beneficiary under a disability can be applied in many situations. It can be simply because someone is a spendthrift, or it could be because they fear creditors. We also see this type of trust used commonly as a special needs trust. It has special provisions, but it's, very, it's common for um, beneficiaries who receive public benefits, and you don't want to lose them. Mary and Sonia and Irene all had real life's challenges that they were facing. But sometimes my clients have, are speculating about what might happen. And that was the situation with Paula. Paula and I went to lunch one afternoon, and she started pumping me with questions about prenuptial agreements. You see, her son had recently gotten engaged, and she was certain she wanted him to have a prenuptial agreement. Her, her son was, um, was successful in his own right, and she had seen how quickly this young lady had been accustomed to her new standard of living. Maybe she was too uh, accustomed to it, got accustomed to it too quickly. Paula wanted to ask her son to have a prenuptial agreement to protect the family wealth. She really didn't care what he did with his own money. But she and her husband had worked very hard to build a company that had commercial real estate in it, quite successful company. And she wanted to protect that. I explained that for a prenuptial agreement to be effective in Pennsylvania, she would ha he would have to disclose all of his holdings. And since she had already started giving him some interest in the family business, the future daughter-in-law would be able to figure out what the family worth, what, worth was, at least within a reasonable degree of certainty. All of a sudden, that prenuptial agreement didn't sound quite as interesting to her. She surely didn't want to divulge the family wealth. What I did suggest for her to do was to set up a a, 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 an irrevocable trust, a trust that would be set up immediately, one for each of her children. Any future gifts or transfers of business interests could be made to the child's trust. The child could serve as one of the trustees but for tax reasons and for distribution reasons, she needed to appoint an independent trustee to work with them. The, child, um, sorry. the trust would insulate all future transfers from creditors and from any claim of an ex-spouse for equitable distribution. It also eliminated the need for her children to have that sometimes uncomfortable discussion about having their spouse-to-be sign a prenuptial agreement. 
it also would serve for her daughter, who was already married, she would not have to ask her husband for a post-nuptial agreement, which he would surely would not sign. The independent trustee would be the heavy. They could deny distributions and let the child blame them for this fact. Wouldn't it be better to put your child in a position to say, honey, I'd love to buy you yet another new car, but that terrible trustee won't give me my money. Now, sometimes my clients' challenges are, about, are not about their spouses or their children or the spouses of their children. Sometimes they're concerned for their companions. The one who's always happy to see them will stop doing anything just to come running to their side. They're often the most loving, the most reliable, the most needy. They're pets. Now, we all read with interest when Leona Helmsley left $12 million to her dog. Now, there are very, very few courts that would ever support a trust for one animal funded with $12 million. But Pennsylvania and many other states do allow for reasonably funded trusts for your pets. My client, Joanne, set up a trust for her pets. Joanne was very active, or is very active, in her local animal rescue. She has six rescue dogs. The thought of her dogs being placed in a kennel or a shelter or being put down when she died was just unacceptable to her. She wanted to make sure that each dog had a good house, a good home to live in, that the new owners would love and care for them, and she would like to reward them for their kindness. As part of her will, she recommended an interim caregiver, someone who would take care of the dogs and help find an appropriate home. That was a friend of hers. The trust would pay all the expenses all the expenses of the house, oh, sorry, the trust was funded with her house and with cash. The caregiver could live in the house free of charge while she was taking care of the dogs and finding a new home. The trust would pay for all the home expenses, food, veterinary bills uh, for the animals. Finally, there was a silent bequest of $10,000 to each person who took one of the dogs. I call it a silent bequest because since they, they don't have a right to this money until they've accepted a dog. And by being silent, it couldn't, it couldn't motivate them, improperly maybe, to take an animal. Unique, yes, but to Joanne, this was very, very important. So why do I like trusts? Because they let my clients address the financial part of life's challenges. Trusts come in many forms. Sometimes they're invisible or almost indistinguishable from the grand tour, like Mary. Sometimes they're effective during life, like Paula. Sometimes and only at death. They can be tailored for the specific needs of one beneficiary, like Irene, or for many. And they can protect beneficiaries from poachers, whether they're creditors or ex-spouses. They can be layered one after another, or they can help, and they can help my clients protect those that they care about the most. Trusts are flexible and be created to address many of life's challenges. Hearing these stories today, I hope you can see why I now am a firm believer that trusts are problem solvers. And I hope that if you are faced with one of life's challenges, you'll look at it critically and you'll ask yourself whether a trust can help with the financial aspect of that challenge. Then ask, what are my concerns? What are my goals? And then find a professional who will help you craft a unique solution to your problem. Thank you.